Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Vijeta Shanai, Assistant Professor, Department of Biochemistry, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Today, I am going to discuss lab investigation for differential diagnosis of jaundice. Before going to the lab investigation, let us see little bit about jaundice. So, jaundice or hyperbilirubinemia, so depending upon the nature of bilirubin elevated it can be classified into conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Based on the cause, jaundice can also be classified into congenital and acquired. Coming to congenital hyperbilirubinemias, there are four types krigler naja syndrome, Gilbert's disease, Dubin-Johnson syndrome and rotor syndrome. So, these four are congenital hyperbilirubinemia. So, what is congenital hyperbilirubinemia? The congenital hyperbilirubinemias are inherited defects due to abnormal uptake conjugation or excretion of bilirubin. So, congenital is by birth, it is may be due to abnormal uptake conjugation or excretion of bilirubin. So, we will look into one by one. The first disorder is krigler najjar syndrome. So, there are two types of krigler najjar syndrome, type 1 and type 2. What happens in type 1? In type 1, there is severe deficiency of enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase. We know that enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase is required for conjugation of bilirubin. Since the enzyme is deficient, there is no conjugation leading to increased unconjugated bilirubin. Therefore, the level of total bilirubin also increases in these infants. When the bilirubin concentration goes above 20 mg per dl, it crosses the blood brain barrier leading to kernicterus. So, usually these children, they die before 2 years of age. Since there is more of unconjugated bilirubin, what happens? The bilirubin enters the blood brain barrier leading to kernicterus and usually these kids die before the age of 2 years. In type 2, it is milder form of krigler naja syndrome because the enzyme is same in two step reaction of conjugation. Only the second stage of conjugation is affected in this patients. So, if you treat with barbiturates, the jaundice improves. In type 1 is very severe form, whereas type 2 is the milder form of krigler naja syndrome. Coming to the second congenital hyperbilirubinemia, that is Gilbert's disease. Gilbert's disease is a inherited autosomal dominant trait. The defect in this disease is there is defect in the uptake of bilirubin by the liver. In these patients, the bilirubin levels may be around 3 mg per deciliter. So, usually most of the time they are asymptomatic and there is only presence of mild jaundice in these patients. The third congenital hyperbilirubinemia is Dubin-Johnson syndrome. In Dubin-Johnson, it is an autosomal recessive trait. The problem here is there is defect in the excretion of conjugated bilirubin. Conjugation is happening normally, but there is defect in the excretion of this conjugated bilirubin. So, what happens? The level of conjugated bilirubin increases. Since there is a defect in the excretion, what happens? The transport of this conjugated bilirubin from the liver to the bile is defected. That is why the conjugated bilirubin gets accumulates in the liver leading to black liver jaundice. 
Since there is a defect in the transport from the liver to the bile, the bilirubin accumulates in the liver leading to black liver jaundice. The last type of congenital hyperbilirubinemia is rotor syndrome. It is also an autosomal recessive trait. The problem here is bilirubin excretion, but there is no staining of liver. So, there are four congenital hyperbilirubinemias which we discussed. First one was krigler naja syndrome, the second one was Dubin-Johnson, then Gilbert's, then Rotus. So, these four are congenital hyperbilirubinemias. Coming to acquired hyperbilirubinemias, they are physiological jaundice, breast milk jaundice, hemolytic disease of the newborn as well as hemolytic jaundice of adult, hepatocellular jaundice and obstructive jaundice. As the name suggests acquired means there is no inherited defect. Coming to physiological jaundice, this is seen in neonates, so it is called as neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Usually seen after the second day of life, there is presence of mild jaundice. The baby's liver is immature, so whenever there is an accelerated rate of RBC destruction, the immature hepatic system cannot conjugate effectively the bilirubin conjugation. So, in physiological jaundice, there is mild jaundice because of the accelerated rate of RBC destruction, the immature hepatic system of conjugation is defective. The bilirubin increases, but it does not increase more than 5 milligram per deciliter and this increased level of bilirubin disappears by second week of life. So, this is physiological jaundice. Coming to breast milk jaundice, so infants who are breastfed, what happens? The mother has the hormone estrogen. These estrogen and its derivatives, they can cross, they can go to infants, infant when they are breastfed. So, there is a transfer of these estrogen derivatives from the mother to the infant through the milk. This estrogen derivatives, they inhibits the glucuronyl transferase, which inhibits the conjugation of bilirubin leading to increased level of total bilirubin thereby leading to jaundice. This is breast milk jaundice. So, breastfed infants when the, the mother's milk when the baby uh, the estrogen derivatives goes to infant and these estrogen derivatives they inhibits the enzyme which is required for conjugation of bilirubin leading to jaundice. Coming to hemolytic jaundice of the newborn, it is mainly seen whenever there is an incompatibility between maternal and fetal blood groups. Usually babies will have Rh positive blood whereas mother will have Rh negative, mother, negative blood. So, what happens during the delivery some amount of Rh positive enters the mother's blood circulation. Since mother is Rh negative, the mother's blood will develop antibodies. Usually, the first child escapes. During the second pregnancy, if the baby is Rh positive, the antibodies from the mother passes into the baby. Since there is Rh positive blood and the mother transfers Rh positive antibodies, the, these antibodies destruct the RBCs leading to erythroblastosis fetalis. So, in erythroblastosis fetalis, when the bilirubin level goes more than 20 milligram per deciliter, what happens? The capacity of the albumin to bind the bilirubin exceeds. So, in the infants, when they are less than 1 year of age, their blood brain barrier is not fully mature. So, bilirubin can enter the brain easily and leading to kernicterites. Because there is more accumulation of bilirubin in the blood, it can lead to mental retardation and toxic encephalopathy. In erythroblastosis fetalis, there is more destruction of RBC and there is more production of bilirubin. 
when the bilirubin levels are more than 20 mg per deciliter in infants when they are less than 1 year of age their blood brain barrier is immature so that bilirubin can easily pass through the blood brain barrier and enters the brain and accumulation of these bilirubin in the brain leads to mental retardation and toxic encephalopathy. Coming to jaundice in adults, there are three types prehepatic or hemolytic jaundice, hepatic jaundice, posthepatic or obstructive jaundice. In prehepatic jaundice, there are many causes. The pneumonic is MARS, malaria, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, RH incompatibility, sickle cell anemia. In prehepatic jaundice, the unconjugated bilirubin is increased the enzymes of the hepatic systems are normal and in the urine the level of urobilinogen increases and in the feces the stercobilinogen increases. Whereas in case of hepatic type of jaundice the main cause for hepatic jaundice are hepatitis, toxins or drugs. In this condition both unconjugated as well as conjugated bilirubin will be increased. The enzymes of the liver the AST and ALT they are increased and urine urobilinogen and stercobilinogen will be positive. Whereas in post hepatic or obstructive jaundice the causes for the, these are gallstone, pancreatic tumor or cholangiocarcinoma. In this condition only the conjugated bilirubin is increased. The enzymes of the liver they are AST, ALT are normal. The enzyme which is present in the biliary canaliculi that is ALP enzyme that is markedly increased and since there is a obstruction bilirubin cannot reach the intestine therefore there is no presence of urobilinogen and stercobilinogen. So in the urine urobilinogens are absent and in the feces stercobilinogens are absent leading to clay colored stool. So, this completes the jaundice, the types of jaundice. So, we have seen that jaundice there are two types congenital and acquired. The causes for congenital are Krigler Najjar syndrome, Gilbert's disease, Dubin Johnson syndrome, and Rotor syndrome. Whereas, acquired jaundice there are many different types, they are physiological jaundice breast milk jaundice, hemolytic jaundice of the newborn as well as hemolytic jaundice seen in adults, hepatocellular jaundice, obstructive jaundice. Coming to the lab investigations for differential diagnosis of jaundice, in the lab investigation you can collect two type of samples, blood samples or urine sample. In the blood sample you can measure serum total bilirubin, serum unconjugated bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin, albumin, prothrombin time and enzymes. Enzymes such as aspartate transaminases, alanine transaminases, alkaline phosphatase, gamma glutamyl transferases. In the urine sample we can estimate urobilinogen levels, presence of bile salts and bile acids. Coming to bilirubin, the total bilirubin concentration in the blood should be between 0.2 to 1 milligram per deciliter. Serum conjugated bilirubin should be between 0.2 to 0 0.6 milligram per deciliter and serum unconjugated bilirubin should be between 0 to 0 0.2 milligram per deciliter. These are the normal level of bilirubin and different types of bilirubin in the blood. So, how to estimate the bilirubin in the given blood sample? So, the sample should be treated with diazotized sulfanilic acid. So, you take the sample, you add the diazotized sulfanilic acid. If there is appearance immediately appearance of purple color, then it is called as the direct reaction. You have taken the sample, added the reagent, you have got the color immediately. So, it is a direct reaction which indicates that 
conjugated bilirubin is present. Why there is a purple color? The purple color is because of the azo pigment. If you take the sample and you treat it with alcohol, then you add the reagent that is diazotized sulfanilic acid and after the treatment with the alcohol, if you get the purple color, then it is called as indirect reaction. So, the indirect reaction says that there is a presence of unconjugated bilirubin because why it is called as indirect? You, have, you are treating the sample with alcohol. So, there is you are adding one additional reagent that is why it is called as indirect reaction. Suppose the sample contains both conjugated bilirubin as well as unconjugated bilirubin. How to estimate that? So, first you take the sample, add the diazotized sulfonylic acid, you will get the purple color which indicates that the conjugated bilirubin is present. Why conjugated gives positive direct reaction? Because conjugated bilirubin is soluble in water. To the same sample, you add the alcohol. If the color of this purple enhances, which indicates that indirect bilirubin, now it has acted because you have added the alcohol. That is why the color which was initially purple, now the color has intensified, which means the sample contains both co conjugated as well as unconjugated bilirubin. The unconjugated bilirubin is water insoluble. That is why you have to add alcohol, then only it reacts with the reagent. Since the conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and it gives the reaction of Vandenberg directly, it is also called as direct bilirubin. Indirect bilirubin is unconjugated bilirubin because it is water insoluble, you have to add one extra reagent for the Vandenberg reactions to occur. So, whatever the purple color you obtain using the colorimeter, we can estimate the concentration of bilirubin in the given sample. The next test which you can perform in the blood is serum albumin. Why we have to perform serum albumin? Because we know that most of the proteins are synthesized by the liver. So, the normal concentration of serum albumin is 3.5 to 5.3 grams per deciliter. The synthesis of albumin, it depends upon the extent of the functioning of liver cell mass. The half-life of albumin is 20 days. That is for it indicates that if there is a chronic liver disease, then only the level of albumin decreases. So, albumin is a marker for chronic liver disease. If there is acute liver diseases, there is no sudden fall of albumin because the half life of albumin is 20 days. Why we have to measure prothrombin time? Prothrombin is also synthesized by liver. It is a marker for liver function. The half life is 6 hours. So, it says about the present functioning of the liver cells. The prothrombin times are prolonged when the liver loses more than 80 percent of its reserve capacity. There is one more cause where there is the prothrombin time is also increased that is when there is deficiency of vitamin K. So, how to differentiate whether this prothrombin time increase is due to vitamin K deficiency or liver disease? If you treat the patient with vitamin K doses and if there is prothrombin time improves which means that the patient is having vitamin K deficiency. But after the intake of vitamin K still there is no effect on prothrombin time which means there is underlying liver disease. Then coming to the specific enzyme measurements. So, enzymes which are markers of hepatocellular injury, they are transaminases, alanine transaminases and aspartate 
transaminases and there are enzymes which are markers of cholestasis that is obstructive jaundice alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transferase so coming to aspartate amino transferase or aspartate transaminases the normal range is 15 to 30 units per liter it is a marker of hepatocellular jaundice the levels are very much increased in case of chronic hepatitis cirrhosis and liver cancer alanin amino transferase also called as alanin transaminases they are more liver specific they are more specific than the ast enzyme the normal range of alt in males is 13 to 35 units per liter whereas in females it is 10 to 30 units per liter the levels are very much increased in acute hepatitis the moderate elevation is seen in alcoholic hepatitis and minor elevation is seen in cirrhosis hepatitis c and non alcoholic steatohepatitis we can see the ratio of ast to alt the normal ratio is 0.8 if the ratio is seen more than 2 then it indicates maybe alcoholic hepatitis myocardial infarction hepatitis with necrosis non alcoholic steatohepatitis if the ratio of ast to alt is lower which means alt is very much increased these are mainly seen in acute hepatocellular injury toxic exposure of the liver or extra hepatic obstruction coming to alkaline phosphatase this enzyme has six isoenzyme it is present in the biliary canaliculi the normal range is 40 to 125 units per liter and the alp enzyme is very much increased in obstructive jaundice because of the obstruction the alkaline phosphatase which are present in the biliary canaliculi are released the bile which is accumulated irritates this epithelial cell of the biliary canaliculi and enzyme secretion increases so it is an marker of obstructive jaundice coming to gamma glutamyl transferase the normal range is 10 to 30 units per liter ggt that is gamma glutamyl transferase is incre increased in alcoholics so it is an indicator of alcoholic hepatitis in the urine sample we can measure bile pigment bile salt and urobilinogens coming to bile pigments the name of the test is fauches test take the urine you heat it with barium sulfate in this reaction it adsorbs the bilirubin when we add the ferric chloride solution the bilirubin gets oxidizes and forms the biliverdin which is a bile pigments which is green in color at the end of this test if the green color appears which means that bile pigment is present coming to bile salts the name of the test is hayes test take the urine sample add the sulfur powder if sulfur sinks to the bottom of the test tube which means that bile salts are present so these two tests are indic if these two tests are positive it indicates the presence of obstructive jaundice urobilinogen is estimated with the help of ehrlich test bilinogens they reacts with the ehrlich aldehyde reagent and gives the red color when you add the oxidizing agent this oxidizes the bilirubin to biliverdin and finally there is appearance of green color to summarize we have first discussed the types of hyperbilirubinemia there are congenital causes and acquired causes under congenital causes we discussed about krigler najjar syndrome type 1 and type 2 gilbert's disease rotter's disease and dubin johnson's disease in acquired hyperbilirubinemia we discussed physiological jaundice breast milk jaundice hemolytic disease of the newborn hemolytic jaundice of the adult hepatic jaundice and obstructive jaundice and we then 
came to the lab investigation. In the lab you can collect blood sample and the urine sample. In the blood we can estimate serum, total bilirubin, conjugated bilirubin, unconjugated bilirubin, enzymes which are specific to the liver, AST, ELT, ALP, GGT, serum albumin and prothrombin time. In the urine sample we can estimate bilirubin, bilinogens and bile salts. Thank you.